All right, now let's look at domain algebraically. And when it comes to domain, it really depends on which family of functions that you're working with. If, as long as you remember for this family, this is the rule, for that family, that's the rule, then domain is just a matter of following those steps for that particular set of functions. So the first family we're going to look at is polynomials, because this is the super easiest one. Here's an example of a polynomial. Uh, it's just a bunch of stuff being added or subtracted together. And it basically comes down to, I can plug in any x value I want in here. I can plug in 7, I can plug in negative 4 billion, I can plug in positive 360,722. If I plug it in, it may be a really ugly answer, but it's still gonna, I'm still going to get an answer. So polynomials, domain is always going to be all real numbers. It doesn't matter what the polynomial looks like. If it's a polynomial, the domain is all real numbers, always and forever. Now, for other sets of functions, it's always not, it's typically not that easy. For example, rational functions. What do I mean by rational? That's a fraction. So when it comes to fractions, there's only one thing we have to be careful with. The denominator is not allowed to be zero. So it doesn't matter what's in the numerator. All I really have to focus on is the denominator. So I can basically pull that denominator out of the problem and say that it can't equal zero. So this is just like solving an equation equal to zero. We're just saying that it's not equal to zero. So if I solve this one for x, x plus 1 can't be 0, therefore x can't be negative 1. So the domain can be any number as long as the x value is not negative 1. So I can just write it like this, all real numbers, x cannot equal negative 1, or in the interval notation, negative infinity to negative 1, union negative 1 to infinity. So for rational functions, general rule, just set the denominator equal to 0, because the denominator can't be 0. Then our next set of functions are going to be radical functions. But radicals, we have different rules if it's an even radical versus an odd radical. Even radical would be like a square root, in other words, a second degree root. With even radicals, the rule is that the inside can't be negative. Because if the inside was negative, we would take square root of a negative number, which is imaginary, and that's not allowed. So we just extract that inside, in this case, x plus 1 again. And if it can't be negative, that means it has to be positive or zero. So we just say x plus 1 has to be greater than or equal to zero. And when we solve, we say x plus, or x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1. So we have our domain. All real numbers, x is greater than or equal to negative 1, or in the interval notation, negative 1 to infinity. So for even radical functions, the rule is that it can't be negative. In other words, set it greater than or equal to zero. Odd radicals, on the other hand, are a little bit more forgiving. A cube root. We don't have any imaginary number situations when it comes to cube roots or fifth roots or any odd root. I can take the cube root of negative 8 and get negative 2 versus taking a square root of negative 4 and getting 2i. So for odd radicals, there are no restrictions. So just like polynomials, all real numbers for odd radicals. All right, let's look at some examples. Why don't you see if you can try these on your own first and then hit play when you're ready. All right, looking at the first one. So first thing we always have to do is decide what family are we looking at so that we know what rule to apply. We are looking at a ra uh, rational function. And the rule for rational functions is that the denominator cannot be 0. So I really don't care about the top. I'm just going to look at the 2x plus 3, say it can't be 0, and solve for x. So I get negative 3 halves, which means our domain is all real numbers, except x cannot equal negative 3 halves. Easy peasy. This time we have a square root. My rule for square roots was that the inside it has to be greater than or equal to 0. It can't be negative. So I will say 5 minus x is greater than or equal to 0. Solve for x. Subtract the 5 from both sides, divide by the negative, which flips the inequality. That means x is less than or equal to 5. So we have an interval from negative infinity up to 5, closed on 5. Here, we don't have a radical. We don't have a fraction. We have a polynomial. So all I have to do is look at this, this one and say the answer is all real numbers. No work required. All right, here once again we have a rational function. I don't care about the numerator, I only care about the denominator, so I'm just going to say that x squared minus 9 cannot equal to 0 and solve for x. And when I solve for x, I'm going to end up with two separate answers, positive and negative 3. 
So this one has two domain restrictions. All real numbers x cannot be positive or negative 3. All right, let's take a moment and talk about symmetry. Now, there's another word for y-axis symmetry. We call those even functions. Now, the reason we call y-axis symmetry an even function is, let's look at an example, x squared. If I graph x squared, hopefully remember that's a parabola, which has y-axis symmetry. And that's just a basic feature of all functions that are raised to an even power. They have y-axis symmetry because if I plug in a positive x value or a negative x value, I'm going to get the same y value either way. If I plug in x equals 3 or x equals negative 3, because I'm raising it to an even power, I'm always going to get the same y value, which is what y-axis symmetry is. Therefore, we can say if it's y-axis symmetry, we can call that an even function. So over here, we're going to have if both f of x and f of negative x equal y, then I can say f of negative x equals f of x, which it gives us a little bit of a rule that even functions must follow. If I plug in a negative number into an even function, I can go ahead and just ignore that negative because it's going to be the same answer as if I was plugging in a positive x value. So it's a helpful little trick to help us either evaluate with even functions or to prove that a function is even. If I can plug in a negative x value and simplify back to the original function, then I know it's an even function. Odd functions, on the other hand, have origin symmetry. So y-axis is even, odd is origin. x cubed, raised to an odd number. If I look at the graph, here's the graph of x cubed. It's symmetric around the origin. If I plug in a positive x value, I get a corresponding y value. If I plug in its ne the negative version of that x value, I actually get the exact opposite y value. So since y is equal to f of x, I could actually take that f of x and plug it into this second equation and say that f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. So we have our rule for odd functions. If I can plug in a negative x value, simplify it to essentially the opposite of the original uh, function, then that's an odd function. Or if I'm evaluating with odd functions, if I plug in a negative x value, I can actually take that negative and pull it all the way out and evaluate as if it was a positive x value and just make my answer negative when I'm done. So again, the process by which we're going to follow to prove whether a function is even or odd is simply plugging in the negative x value. And if it simplifies to the original, we can say it's an even function. If it simplifies to the opposite of the original, we can say it's an odd function. And if it simplifies to neither the original nor the exact opposite, then we just say it's neither even nor odd. So let's practice. Classify the function as even, odd, or neither. Hit play when you're ready. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to plug in a negative x value. Anywhere we see x, we're going to plug in negative x. And then we're going to simplify and see what happens. If I take negative x to the fifth power, a negative times itself five times is still going to be negative. So that 3 becomes a negative 3. Same thing over here. A positive 4 times a negative x is going to be negative 4x. So now we compare original to our new version. And I see that every term is the opposite of what I started with. Therefore, this is an odd function. Let's try it again. Once again, we'll plug in a negative x anywhere I see an x. Negative x squared, the square is going to take that negative and turn it into a positive. So when I simplify, I simplify right back to the original function. Therefore, this is an even function. Now, if we look at this one, plugging in negative x everywhere, I see that negative x to the fifth is going to stay negative. Uh, this negative x times 4, that's going to stay negative. But that 2 is not going to change at all. It's still going to be a positive 2. So when I look at the original function compared to my simplified function, the first two terms are the opposite. But that last term stayed the same. Therefore, this is not completely opposite. We have to say that this is neither. This one has no symmetry because it was neither even nor odd. Now, as we were going through those practice problems, I wonder if you noticed a pattern. Because there was one. All you have to do is look at the exponents, because the exponents are what determines 
whether the negative is going to go away or if it's still going to be there. On this one, we had x to the fifth, and technically this one said x to the first. Both exponents are odd, and overall that function was odd. On this one, we had x squared, and this one didn't have a variable, but technically it did. If there's no variable, well, really that means you have x to the zeroth power because you have zero variables. 2 is an even number. 0 is an even number. Overall, this one was even. And then on this one, we had 5, 1, and 0 again. 5 is odd, 1 is odd, but 0 is even. So this one couldn't agree with itself. It was neither even nor odd, so it's neither. So in the future, you don't have to waste your time plugging in those negative x values. You can simply eyeball it. Look at the exponents. If they all agree as to whether they're even or odd, then that's your answer. If they don't agree, then just write neither. Now, there are certain rules that dictate even versus odd when the problems get a little bit more complex. If we think of even functions as positive and odd functions as negative, and of course the reason for that was all the way back to those rules, even function f of negative x equals f of x, odd functions f of negative x equals negative f of x. This is why we think of even functions as positive, odd functions as negative. And the rules for positive and negative are still the rules for positive and negative. If I take an even plus an even, or a positive plus a positive, we get a positive. So an even plus an even is still even. An odd plus an odd, a negative plus a negative, is still going to be a negative. A negative 3 plus a negative 4 is still going to be a negative 7. So odd plus odd is odd. Now, if I combine evens and odds, well, that's really going to depend on which one is larger, if this number is larger versus if this number is larger. So it's really kind of inconclusive. That's why we say neither. It's neither even nor odd because there's not enough information to come to a conclusion. So what about when we multiply an even times an even? Well, a positive times a positive is still a positive. So when I multiply even functions, I still have an even function. An odd times an odd, a negative and a negative is also a positive. When I multiply odd functions, I get an even function. And if I mix and match an even times an odd, a negative and a positive, well, that's going to be negative. Therefore, it's going to be an odd function. So when it's just simple polynomials, we can just look if everything agrees, even and even, it's even. Odd and odd, it's odd. Mix and match, we say neither. But when I'm multiplying or dividing, remember the multiplication and division rules are the same, as long as I remember the rules for positives and negatives, I can predict what it's going to be simply by eyeballing it. Let's look at these examples. So if I look at the first one, remember that this is really x times square root of 1 minus x squared. If I think about x as its own separate term, its own separate polynomial, x is to the first power, so that's an odd function. Over here, I, the square root really doesn't dictate anything about the function. We're just going to look on the inside. 1 minus x squared. 1 is x to the 0. This one's x to the second. So I've got even and even. So I've got even on the inside here. And an odd times an even, well, that's going to be an odd function overall. So I didn't have to do any uh, arithmetic, any simplification. I can just eyeball it. The outside is odd. The inside is even. When I multiply odd and even, I get odd. So based on that trick, why don't you try this one? Hit play when you're ready. So here we have a division problem. So we're going to look at the top and the bottom separately. On the top, I've got x squared, which is going to be even. On the bottom, I've got x to the sixth and x to the zero. So that's going to be even. And an even divided by an even is just like a positive over a positive. So it's an even overall. 